Okay, so let's let's get underway. Um, very many of you probably already met Lauren Gorn, who uh, joined us a couple of months ago as an ELDP postdoctoral researcher. Uh, Lauren's project is she's not going to talk about the, the project that she's working on today. She's going to try to give us a chance to hear about that at a later stage. Um, but she's working on a minority Tibeto Burman language called Kagate, which is spoken in Nepal. Um, she's done some really interesting work on uh, evidentiality in particular in this, um, in this language. Um, she did her, she came to us after <coughs> having spent some time as a postdoctoral researcher at Nanyang Technological University, which is based in uh, Singapore. And um, during that time, when she was there, she was actually able to do some field work on, um, on Kagate and to collect some data in advance of, of starting the project here. Uh, her PhD she completed two years ago. Thereabouts. Um, at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And she worked on Yolmo, which is another mon minority Tibetan Burma language, uh, also spoken. She's done extensive field work on Yolmo <coughs> and uh, has written up her uh, analytical material on that in her PhD, which we hope will be published. Before there is a long. forthcoming grammar. There is a grammar coming out. So, um, she's been extremely active, or she is extremely active, uh, on the sort of social media side of things. She, uh, with another colleague, edits the Superlinguo blog. And she twitters all the time. Um, we haven't managed to convince her to get onto Facebook yet, but I've been <laughs> working on that. Um, and yes, you can see the slides are here, uh, are available with a, there's a nice little bit.ly slice uh, a link to, to where you can get your hands on the slides. Um, she also has been importing Australian cultural activity <laughs> into the UK. Um, and as you all know, Australians have a close association. As a recent article showed about Australian pronunciation, a very close association between Australian and alcohol. So um, uh, Lauren's been behind the setting up of linguistics in the pub in London, which of course doesn't have to involve alcohol, but it involves convivial discussions about linguistic issues. And there will be one uh, coming up uh, next month I think on the 8th of December. The 8th of December, venue pending. Um, and uh, there'll be advertisements going around about that. And I'll, I, will, I will also spam the um, postgrad list, so you should see that one. So Lauren's very active, very engaged, and today she's going to tell us about some collaborative work that she's been doing with uh, colleagues looking at issues of citation in linguistics. Really, really sexy topic for a Tuesday. Um, data citation and uh, methodological standards in the genre of linguistics. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for that intro. I, there's not enough people and I feel very, very far away from you behind the lectern. So I'm going to kind of, just going to kind of roll my way out here. I'm going to have to shuffle back occasionally to make sure I'm, I'm kind of following my notes as I want to wand, wend from. Um, you can view these slides uh, if you're online right now. Um, they do look a bit better on a smaller computer <coughs> screen than they do up here. Um, just to kind of, because I'm new here, so a lot of you don't necessarily know the work that I'm doing, but also because it will hopefully help you understand my motivation for today's talk, that I give you a brief background on kind of the part of the world that I work in and the kind of research I've been doing lately. So as Peter mentioned, I work with Yolmo and Kagate, which are kind of two languages within the same family, this kind of collection of Yolmo varieties, and there's Kagate there, spread across Nepal. Um, for my PhD, mainly focusing on evidentiality, 
um, taking a new tact kind of from this point on, but always happy to talk basically endlessly about evidentiality um, as well. These slides, uh, this map looks a lot better if you view it online. You can kind of zoom in and play around. I like digital map making, and this is a chance to gratuitously plug the poor mapping workshop that we'll be running on the 14th of December with the Plants, Animals, Words team, Candide. Um, and I've put together a day where you get to learn how to collect um, ethnobotanical um, samples and information, and then you get to map it really, really pretty. Because um, I think the pretty is what's often missing from linguistic maps. Uh, within the work on Kagate, I kind of have two main foci um, within the project um, funded by ELDP. The first is to build a corpus of Kagate language use. Um, and we're focusing specifically on traditional knowledge, um, traditional folk tales. And this is partly so that the corpus is useful both for um, the community as a repository of cultural knowledge, as well as for linguists who might be interested in the linguistic features of the language. Um, but I always like to think of my work as having three audiences. So we have the linguistic community. You guys get these super fun technical papers like today's paper. The community, we like to try and return useful things to them, whether or not they use them as a different matter. Um, and then the general public. So focusing on the community and the general public, been working with art colleagues in Singapore on a project where we take the traditional stories and turn them into um, pretty picture books, um, posters, online media, those kind of things. And these are some amazing illustrations. This slide does not do them justice. They look fabulous by one of our graduate students um, working on. Um, so we've recorded this traditional story about a jackal Oh, no, it's not Jackal and Crow, it's Jackal and the Old Woman. So we see the jackals there and the old woman. Um, it's a slightly comedic tale that involves death because they have a very grim sense of comedy. The other thing I'm focusing on is um, the use of gesture in discourse. Um, so I, I'm particularly just mentioning this slide in case any of you happen to work on languages of South Asia or Southeast Asia and you recognise this gesture, which if it's done with a shrug kind of has a like... What are you going to do about it? Effect. If you do it with a head nod, it kind of means, what are you up to? It's a vaguely rhetorical sense, but it is also used um, with speech. And I've just put a little gif of one of my speakers here because I'm not really going to analyse it too much today. Um, but if you are familiar with this gesture of kind of the India-Nepal area and you have some data, I will happily chat to you. That's the plug for my gesture stuff. Today, though, I'm going to talk about a project I've been doing with um, a couple of colleagues, um, Andrew Perez Croker and Tyler Heston in Hawaii at the University of Hawaii, and Barbara Kelly, um, who was my PhD supervisor and is still stuck with me um, at the University of Melbourne. As obviously not Tyler. Um, that is Jack Lord from the original Hawaii Five-O. Tyler is, um, or was one of Andrew's graduate students. Um, and is a notoriously difficult guy to pin down online. So uh, that is his current alias for you all there. This project came about because we all work in documentation and description. So the data that I'm going to talk you through today is heavily biased towards a focus on that area because it's the area we all work in. Um, and we're deeply interested not only in doing this work but thinking about how we do it and why we do it and the kinds of outputs that we might create from our research. Um, and we're currently writing this paper up for submission very soon. So um, whatever you think about today's paper, you can ask questions and I will try and address them either now or in a later written publication. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of make a bold statement and I just hope that you're all willing to go with me on this today. But like other, like in sciences, particularly what we think of as hard sciences, we have this idea that claims should be falsifiable, verifiable and reproducible. So if you're going to make a claim about the state of the world, other people should be able to assess that claim based on evidence to hand in order to be able to come to a similar or potentially different conclusion. And I'd like to think that in linguistics, if we treat linguistics as an empirical science, that we value that kind of reproducibility too. If we look at the field of language documentation in particular, this has been discussed more and more frequently in the last couple of decades. Although it's not just constrained to the last couple of decades, there's some wonderful quotes from Malinowski about the benefits of recording linguistic information to analyse more empirically. So it's something linguists have long thought about. 
Um, there is a, a lot of discussion about reproducibility and replicability. And I'm not going to get too deep into the kind of semantics of these, but generally reproducibility is about access to other people's data to make analyses and see if you draw similar or different conclusions. And replicability is the ability to recreate the entire experiment. Um, obviously, language documentation and a lot of other fields of linguistics make it very, very hard to replicate from beginning to end an entire um, data collection, especially for something like discourse analysis that's very context dependent in terms of the uh, information that you're analysing. In terms of how we do the work that we do, just looking specifically at language documentation, there is a wealth of great information out there um, explaining how to do field work, how to collect linguistic data, an increasing genre as well of how to write grammars. Um, so Gippet et al. and the Nakayama and Rice LDNC special that came out, um, as well as many articles over the years in LDNC, Language Documentation and Conservation, and Language Documentation and Description volumes have talked about these topics. So we have a rich literature on how to do the kind of work that we do in collecting and writing up language data. But very few of these explicitly discuss in particular detail um, things like data management, citation and attribution of linguistic data. There are obvious notable exceptions to this. However, on the whole, we're very much focused on how we collect the data, but not necessarily on how we then go about sharing that data or displaying that data to other people. And part of that is the history of the genres that we work in. So when we think about the Boazian history of language documentation with the focus on kind of a trilogy of grammar, dictionary and text, then just implicit in that is the idea that the underlying text is somehow separated from the analytical description. And it's important to remember that grammar writing is not an atheoretical pursuit. I think there are some people who sometimes feel that that's kind of the thing you do and then it's up to typologists or those who have a particular syntactic theory to come along and then use that data to form their theories. But uh, the way that we present our linguistic data is actually making a big claim about what we think language is and how we can analyse it. And so these old habits can be hard to break. So even though we have a lot of really great literature on how we do language documentation um, and linguistic description work, we don't necessarily have um, a habit of writing explicitly about how we do that ourselves. And so we came to this project with some fairly open-ended questions. Before we can think about what we might want to aspire to or what we might want linguistic science to look like in terms of um, citation and reproducibility, uh, we wanted to take the opportunity to look at what the state of the art currently is. And so we decided to conduct a somewhat large-scale survey um, of, of how things are going. So for our study, we examined 100 books. We had 50 published grammars and 50 dissertations. And these, we kind of, it was a sample of convenience. I'll talk about that briefly. But we were trying to get a range of um, authors from a range of institutions, countries, languages of focus, and publishers kind of trying to distribute that kind of variation. And we looked at 271 journal articles across nine journals. Um, and I'll discuss what journals we looked at and why briefly. But we had about 30 from each of those journals. Um, the time period we chose was 1998 to 2003. And that was deliberately based on the fact that the Himmelman 1998 paper is often taken as a fairly... Um, a fairly seminal work in terms of positing language documentation as a, a pursuit worth pursuing in and of itself and thinking about the data that we collect from that as an object that's worthy of kind of explicit discussion in and of itself. So we figured at least five years after that, everyone's kind of taken on board the lessons from Himmelman in 1998 um, if they were going to take them on at all. 
Uh, so just to briefly discuss the journals, we chose nine journals overall. There are four aerial journals. I think it's important to state that even though they may sound a lot like they're just um, a similar genre to descriptive monographs and grammars, a lot of articles do have a really strong theoretical or typological point to make. So even though they're aerial and a lot of the people who write for these journals are language documentation and description people primarily, um, the focus of these articles generally was theoretical or typological. We had two targeted subfields in sociolinguistics and second language acquisition. Um, we had some divergent theoretical persuasions to try and kind of see if there was any variation there. So we have natural language and linguistic theory and studies in language. And we put language in there as well just because it is one of the top journals in our field um, ac across all genres of linguistic study. I've just put the date distribution by year of publication up there, um, not necessarily because it is in and of itself that important, but um, because we had a much larger range of readily accessible journal articles, we could pull off every article for the 10 year period for each journal. Um, we randomly selected across the years um, 30 articles per journal. It's important to note we had a lot of trouble with LTBA um, and for this I feel particularly sad because it is the linguistics of the Tibeto Burman area journal so it's kind of like my, my journal. Um, we couldn't get articles from a certain number of years um, because LTBA changed publisher and all the articles from the previous publisher um, only exist physically for now. Hopefully that's being rectified, um, but it's, a, it's kind of a, a bit of a tragic state of affairs. Um, for books, we had to go for a sample that was much more based on convenience in terms of what we could access. Um, also, it just turns out 2009 was a rubbish year for publishing um, traditional books. Um, so published grammars are in red today and dissertations are in blue. Um, the dissertations also skew towards the end of the decade. Um, that's partly because people are getting better at putting dissertations online. But generally dissertations are really, really hard to get hold of. Um, if you are writing a thesis, please work out something with your institution where even if it's embargoed for a little while, you eventually make it public because there are so many but potentially, I don't know, I can only read the title and the abstract. There are so many amazing sounding dissertations in the world that basically do not exist. If your dissertation is only on paper in a repository and it's hard to access, then it, it yeah, that's my, that's my rant for today. If you're gonna do work, think about how other people might want to actually read it. In terms of data coding, we kind of had two broad areas and I'll talk through each of these in turn. And I'll keep coming back to the slides so you remember what they are. The first is looking at methodology. So we're interested in how people talk about the work that they did. So we wanted to look at things like whether people talked about the participants in the research and the people who participated in, in the data um, giving process, I guess, there. Uh, we also wanted to look at data collection equipment and data collection tools. So for equipment, by that we mean things like recording devices, um, if any were used. For data collection tools, for that we mean any kind of um, potential elicitation stimulus um, or surveys or experimental structures that were conducted. Data analysis tools and software is kind of the post-collection analysis stage. So if you use Prat to analyze phonetic data, or if you're um, interlinearizing using Toolbox or Flex, um, or using R for your statistics, mentioning that. Um, time spent collecting data is obviously gonna vary depending on the linguistic genre. So this might be the amount of time you spent in the field, um, or it might be how long a participant had to, or how long an interview was conducted for but talking about kind of time frames that you were working with and looking at the type of linguistic genres. We then had some data related variables. Um, I'm gonna talk about the methodological variables altogether, so I've just kind of listed them there, but I'll work through the data related variables one by one. Um, so these are the source of data, so where 
does the data come from? For the journals, we broke down all of the genres that were analysed. So I'll talk about that in relation to journals. Looking at where the data is now, um, so if it exists outside of the publication, and the citations conventions used to reference the data, if any. Um, and <laughs> that kind of comma, if any, there is somewhat important because um, what we find is that this is not something that is necessarily commonly done in all genres of linguistics. So today is kind of a chance to, um, I'm going to sh kind of share the findings here, but I hope it's also a chance for you to reflect on um, linguistic methodology and data citation practices in your own work, in your own um, subfield of linguistics and how it might relate to the findings here. So looking at these methodological variables first. Um, for journals, we simply um, had a binary question looking at whether there was some kind of description of data collection methods. Um, and we set our benchmark pretty low here because journals have really strict um, space constraints. Um, they often have a very specific focus. So even if your methodological discussion was a brief passing reference in a footnote, you got a yes from us. And we find a really strong variation here in terms of the journal. So studies in second language acquisition, which I think other data that I present today will make clear, is a strongly experimental focused journal. So almost everything that's published in studies in second language acquisition um, uses some kind of test or experimental instrument um, to test a hypothesis about language acquisition. Um, and so because they're kind of working in the experimental framework, the genre overtly kind of demands a kind of methodological section. It's often overtly marked methodology or something to that effect. Other areas of linguistics don't have the same genre expectations. Um, and so we don't find necessarily as consistent or clear um, use of or discussion of methodology. Um, on average, I think largely helped by second language acquisition journal there, on average 40% of articles will overtly discuss methodology, but there's some really strong journal variation going on there. In terms of the kind of features that were discussed, we decided to condense data collection tools and or equipment um, for journals just because these were categories that we originally created for the monographs um, and it didn't seem necessary to kind of expand so greatly for journals. Um, and also, as I said, the genres collected, we broke that out much more qualitatively. Um, later on. So I'll talk about that further down. Um, a very strong focus on participants um, with a kind of decreasing uh, methodological focus from there. So very strong genre differences across journals, um, but overall if they do talk about anything, they at least mention participants. Again, we set the bar pretty low there. Even just naming a few participants in your acknowledgements for a journal, we decided was sufficient for this category. Um, in terms of the, I'm kind of lumping um, documentation, dissertations and um, descriptive monographs together in this title books, um, but the books I'm talking about are very um, descriptive linguistics focused. Um, I've broken it down by year, not necessarily because it's very important, but I think to just show that consistently dissertations outperform um, published monographs um, in terms of how many categories. So just instead of, so for journals, we simply ask, do they have a methodology, yes or no? For published monographs, we decided to use a Likert rating from one to five as to how extensive the methodology was. Um, but what we found is that correlated pretty neatly with how many of our six features they mentioned. So a more comprehensive, Methodology unsurprisingly mentioned more of the categories. So it's slightly more objective for us to talk about 
how many of these six methodological features they overtly discussed. Um, I should mention that these features that I'm discussing today came organically out of what we found were features that were most often discussed in the documentation and description literature. Um, and then comparing that against a initial subsample of 10 of the grammars. And we felt that that kind of was a, a minimal set of expectations we could ask of a, a rather good methodology. Um, and I'll talk about that more towards the end. I don't think it's necessarily the only things that we need to include in a methodology. But these are the six we focused on. As you can see, um, people generally managed, especially in dissertations, to talk about four of those six categories. We have two hypotheses about why dissertations outperform published grammars. I think the most likely one is simply that if you wrote a dissertation between 19, uh, 2003 and 2012, that's probably based on data that you collected kind of within seven years of that. So it's, it's potentially relatively recent work. Your PhD training is giving you kind of access to the contemporary literature, which you can put straight into practice. Whereas if you have a published monograph in this 10 year period, that may be based on 10 to 20 years of field work. Um, for example, I know Carol Gennetti's Grammar of Dolokhanewa that I often refer to was published in 2007, but she'd been working on that for many, many years. Um, and so it's not necessarily, if you're starting from scratch and you're um, reading the literature about making your methodology clear, you've read Peter's article on meta documentation and you include that in your description, um, you're much more likely to do these things. Carol's grammar incidentally did do very well um, <laughs> in our ratings. So it's not necessarily just about how long you've been writing a grammar for. Um, the other theory is that potentially published grammars and dissertations are two slightly different genres. And because in a dissertation you're attempting to demonstrate that you really do know everything and you are very diligent as a researcher, you may be more likely to go above and beyond in including kind of these methodological features. But either way, the students are outperforming their teachers. And that's not a bad thing, I think. Um, in terms of the features discussed, um, you see that some features are more frequently discussed than others. Um, so for grammars, all we asked is that people overtly, critically considered the range of genres that they had in their dissertation. Um, where, and so a lot of people did that. So we had 50 grammars and 50 dissertations. So that's 42, so almost everyone um, of the dissertations discussed that topic. Whereas for some other topics, people are much less likely to discuss those. So methodologically, we have some very, very strong performers, um, but on the whole, uh, not always so strong. In terms of the data-related variables, so that was talking about how people talk about their research context. Whereas when people talk about the kind of data they use, um, I'm going to go again through the journal data and then I'll go through the um, book data. So for journals, um, there is a variety of source data. Um, so people might be drawing on their own research, on existing published data, on unpublished data, be that unpublished or in terms of um, manuscripts or in another person's field notes. Introspection still is a genre that exists um, in linguistic analysis, although it may not be so frequently drawn upon in language documentation. Um, and we have source data unstated or not applicable. And not applicable was to things like if all the data that was presented was summarised journal information, or so, sorry, summarised experimental inf information or kind of um, generalised over phonetic information for those kind of things. Um, kind of thinking about the source of data is not always applicable. Um, what we see here is that there is still an overwhelming focus 
on using one's own data in linguistic analysis. Uh, and those who aren't using their own data are generally using something that's published um, or we simply don't know where the data comes from. The general assumption there seems to be that it is probably their own, um, but it's not necessarily made clear. Um, these Pareto charts actually are pretty neat. I can say that because I didn't make them myself. This is Andrea's R wizardry that deserves to be recognised here. What we see is the frequency out of the 471 papers um, on this, and that's recognised as a percentage, and that's how a cumulative percentage um, along the tail there. So um, what we see, though, is that there is quite a bit of source data variation across the journals. So for studies in second language acquisition, sorry, the slides is not as clear as I'd hoped. Studies in second language acquisition, overwhelmingly their own data, um, experimental data that they collected themselves and then wrote up. For LTBA, we see a very strong focus on published work. Um, so drawing on existing word lists or texts or analyses um, to present one's own. And then in natural language and linguistic theory, um, overwhelmingly, un well not overwhelmingly, but between unstated and own, um, that seems to take up most of it with some published work as well. So depending on the journal, we see some variation in, in where data comes from. In terms of the data genre, we kind of let this filter up and, and collected whatever categories people discussed um, in each of the articles. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. I just think it's a really nice demonstration of the breadth of the kind of data that linguists are dealing with. And I think um, some of them kind of capture some of the challenges that we have um, for data citation and how we go about citing data because different linguists are working at very different levels of analysis. So we have something like a spectrogram compared to something like a questionnaire um, or comparing that to um, an entire story or a text um, or uh, songs. These are very, very different genres very, very different types of language data and we need to think about whether we can reconcile them into a single way of thinking about data or if they are going to require their own ways to be considered. Across all the journals, there is still, I mean, there is a very, very long tail there. It really um, goes through all the reds and yellows. Um, but there is still a really strong focus on sentential level, lexical level and text um, which I think indicates that we still have a focus on what might be considered traditional domains of linguistic analysis across, um, across the field of linguistics. In terms of individual journals, I've pulled out the journal of African Languages and Linguistics, Studies in Language and Studies in Second Language Acquisition, um, and we see some very different focuses there. So um, for African language and linguistics, a very strong lexical focus, um, possibly um, a lot of interest in kind of untangling um, noun classes and complex verbal morphology. Whereas for studies in language, it's a um, much more text heavy. Um, and in studies in second language acquisition, tests and experiments take up the first two. In terms of where the data is now, um, I've given a, a, the, the kind of categories we discovered. So archived, if the data is published, so it may be that they're working with an entire published collection of texts, and that is in and of itself all the data that's available, um, or the article contains the primary data, or a summary of it, um, or the location is unstated or online. But what we find is that unstated is overwhelmingly the majority for our journals. So for over, well, it's just over 200 of our articles, we simply don't know where the data is now. So published is a distant second um, and then a summary. 
but we can see archived is this tiny little blip down here. There is um, the only journal where unstated isn't the overwhelming first, um, by the way, is Oceanic Linguistics, where it's neck and neck with published data. So I, th I think there's a point to be made here that, and, and a, lot of, a lot of these themes and where linguistics could possibly be doing better is part of a larger cultural attitude about data and what it means to acquire data, what it means to own data and work with data. And I think one of the biggest cultural hurdles we have to overcome as a community is thinking about the role of archived and the role of publicly archived data. Um, and, and kind of a lot of the conversations we've had among ourselves um, and that I've had with people when doing hosting events like linguistics in the pub is that there is a real anxiety about making your data accessible to other linguists. Um, and it's an anxiety about being scooped on your own analysis. Um, and I think that in a lot of ways, actually, <laughs> the kind of the reality of someone else coming in and scooping you on your analysis of ergativity in a language are in many ways unfounded given the realities that everyone is actually very busy working on their own data. But I think it's part of a larger cultural problem that we need to think about in terms of um, recognising the importance of archives, recognising the importance of corpus creation. And if someone does come in and presents an analysis of your ergative, marking ergativity in the language you've, you've created a corpus of, then we need to formalise how recognition is given to the hard work you've done of building that corpus. And um, I'll discuss citation next. I think that's one way to do that. But overall, there seems to be a reluctance to archive work. We found, so in terms of citing your examples and explaining where they came from, we found, even with very broad uh, kind of categories, there were about 18 different ways that people would cite their data. I'm not going to walk you through all of those. Um, this is a talk that Andrea and I gave at a Delaman workshop, which is the archives network um, for language documentation and music. Um, that lists all 18 of those conventions. I was going to talk you through a couple of them because I think, as I said before, it illustrates nicely um, some of the problems we have about the different levels of linguistic data and how we might refer to each of them. So we have, if you're citing an example from an existing document, that's quite easy. You can rely on your standard APA citation convention, cite the author, cite the page number. That's quite reliable. If you're citing um, a Bible quotation, again, there's a nice standardised, conventionalised way of doing that, um, and that makes it a lot easier. But citing your own work, uh, as we can see, there's a variety of ways of doing that. You can cite um, to just naming the language. So this is a very global level bit of information um, where you simply give the language name. You could refer to the speaker um, and give information about the speaker as your citation. This is particularly possible in the, uh, common in the Journal of Sociolinguistics. It's very common to refer to the speaker. Perhaps um, sometimes it's just initials, sometimes it's first name, sometimes it's a pseudonym. Um, there are a variety of possibilities here. And sometimes more or less metadata on the speaker is available. Here we see the speaker's gender and age, um, but there can be more or less other additional metadata about the person in the paper or not. The citation can take the form of the title of the story. Again, this could include also additional information like the speaker name, but it kind of is focusing on the level of the text rather than the speaker and anything that the speaker may or may not have said. Citation conventions can be used to the level of example, um, and often this is some kind of code that's explained by the author. So here we can see that the author has told us that speaker BN on tape three, transcription page 12, said this sentence. And provided that this author has at least 
labelled, there's a lot of provisions here, but if this author has labelled the cassettes correctly, if we know where the cassettes are, if they've kept their transcriptions and we can resolve the transcription to the cassette, we can eventually find our way back to that original utterance if we wanted to verify. If we want to say, ah, oh, I, don't, I don't reckon we would hear a, a voiced fricative at the end there. I think we'd hear something else. We could actually, with put a little bit of, of figuring out if we had access to the original information, figure that out in a way that might be a lot harder if all we're looking for is a story called Broccoli, which may be two hours long. So um, sometimes we also, we also had to have a category for where people had used some kind of code um, but had not explained what that code was. Um, and there are two possibilities here. Either the person themselves knows and it's kind of more for their record or it's just a way to kind of make it look more official. Um, probably a little bit of both there. Uh, we also had to include these categories. If something appears as a reference to an unpublished manuscript, um, if they did not any, include any form of citation, um, if there was no numbered examples or anything that we could cite, and we had other. Um, and other was for kind of interesting cases that didn't quite fit any of the other categories. For example, we had one where interviews were conducted and the name of the person who conducted the interview was given as the metadata point. So it didn't really relate to the, it had nothing to do with the speaker, but it was more to do with who had conducted the interview, um, which didn't really relate to the linguistic information. So that went in our other category. Now, I could have gone through all 18 categories and explained them in depth and which ones are potentially better in terms of uh, citability and, and retrievability. Uh, but actually, the main takeaway from this point is that overwhelmingly people do not cite data. Or our next best option is that they do some kind of standard citation. Um, and after that, we get the very exciting, just a kind of blanket description of the data, and that's kind of as much as you get for citation. So even though some people are putting a divergent range of, of conventions into practice, actually the majority of people are not citing conventions and not using any citation convention. And so we have this aspiration to being um, a kind of objective uh, endeavour, but we're not really living up to it in terms of how we do our work. And if you ever come to one of my data management talks, um, the main takeaway, even if you're not really interested in other people accessing your data and you don't want them to ever get their hands on that ergative before you do, um, if, if there's one reason I can try to motivate you to cite your work correctly um, is because as an overwhelmingly lazy person, I have to say that it makes my life a lot easier. If I can go back and re-listen to something and I don't have to spend half a day kind of tearing through recordings or trying to like weird, use weird find techniques on my transcripts. Um, if I can just go, oh, I took that from that recording, isn't that nice? Um, even if it's just for your own sake, citation is useful. Just very briefly, looking at these same questions in terms of the monographs um, and mainly just flagging differences to the journals is that the source of data is much more consistent for monographs, unsurprisingly. They're of a single genre. Um, the dissertations overwhelmingly mentioned well, were entirely based on original field work. That's not too surprising. These all add up to more than 50, by the way, because some people would draw on their own field work and supplement that with existing materials. Um, in terms of where the data is now, though, Linguists aren't necessarily, in documentation, aren't necessarily doing a whole lot better than anyone else. There's this really great, I really love this category, so it turned up a lot in language documentation and description. This is where people in their methodology section or area or paragraph, depending on how comprehensive they were, would say something like, oh, and the, um, at the conclusion of the project, it will all be archived with ELAR or Paradisec or the university um, and I think the strike rate 
I think about two out of those five uh, grammars, there is actually some evidence that they have archived their data. But um, <laughs> it's kind of a, it looks really nice to say that you'll archive it, um, but then you realise it actually takes work and time. Um, there are a range of different options people have had for sharing, so they might share it with the community or put the information online. In terms of, well, you can see the group that I'm clearly angling for there. In terms of the citation type used, um, because it's a more consistent um, group, we kind of we bind them into five categories of how detailed the citation types were. So a lot of people had no data citation, which meant that if I opened up a grammar and pointed to one of the 1,058 examples in there, it's quite possible the author would not actually be able to retrieve that from a recording or elicitation. I mean, they might have a phenomenal memory, um, but if you can't just call them up and ask them, that makes it a little bit inaccessible. Um, some people for most examples would give some kind of minimal reference to um, the speaker or the story when referring to examples or there would be some kind of reference that would call back to a corpus that may or may not be included in the grammar or a metadata list of titles may or may not be included in the grammar. Um, so you'd get something like, oh, this was a speaker or it was this story and you can actually chase that up um, if you tried to. We had quite a few people who would give us a nice um, kind of retrievable, resolvable tag but would not necessarily um, explain if it was archived or where it was archived or if we could ever make use of this tag. And finally, in this tiny little section up the top here, we had some kind of code that was fully um, resolvable to the underlying corpus um, that had time codes and was archived. And I've pulled together all these examples instead of naming and shaming other people. Um, these are all kind of creative embellishments on my own corpus. And for each example in the corpus, I've given the speaker's initials this is the archive label with Paradisec, soon to be Elar as well. That's actually the date, but it's um, together it's a file reference and the time code if it's a spontaneous or, or kind of naturalistic example. And that kind of thing is somewhat, I mean everything in, in documentation and devils are time consuming, but if you invest that time from the beginning, it's a lot easier than attempting to do it post hoc. I'm not going to go through all of those citation conventions with examples, but I do just want to flag that um, this is just one example of how in many ways language documentation is quite a good model for how resolvability can work if done well. So this is from Valerie Guren's thesis from 2008. So she has some nice codes here. Um, she gives a very clear explanation of this in the methodology at the beginning of her grammar. Um, if we look at that reference, she says that the data is archived with Paradisec and if we actually go to the Paradisec page um, where it's archived, all I had to do was search that little five digit number and it pulled up, it took me... A, oh no, it's Elar, isn't it? Sorry, I've been working with both of them, they've kind of merged in my brain. Um, I like the MOVE. I am, I am not going to accept that. Um, it took me about 30 seconds to get to this page and if she archived with Paradisic it would probably take about the same amount of time. Um, if you're willing to sign up with the Endangered Language Archive um, and their access policy, um, you could go listen to this right now by following this link. So it's nice and accessible for other people to listen to those examples. If I was a researcher who might think, oh, that's a very interesting form for the first person in languages of this area, then I could confirm that it's definitely that. It wouldn't take me a whole lot of time. And you can get some extra metadata about the recording there. That's really nice. So it's kind of hard 
I mean, we have to face the fact that on the whole, people aren't doing that great in terms of being transparent about their methodology and they're not doing that great in terms of making it clear how the work that they're writing resolves to the underlying data. So we've discussed some of the features that we think are, well, that have kind of come out of our discussions about um, what we've thought are important basic features of methodology to consider. And we believe that research should link to underlying data. So that example of the gesture that I gave you um, that came with this utterance, um, you know, I, I employ this kind of practice in my work. So we try very hard to practice what we preach. But if you included Barb's grammar of Sherpa um, in, in this analysis, hers probably wouldn't hold up that well either. And she'd probably be very frank about that fact. But I think it's important, it's not, it's not up to us to kind of stand here and harangue you and tell you what we think may or may not make a good descriptive grammar methodology or what might make a good minimum citation standard. Um, it's up to us as a research community to articulate what we value if we do find this important, if we think it's important that other people be able to go back and listen to the examples that we think are canonical examples of certain phenomena in the languages we work in. And part of that is to encourage good practice. Um, I don't think it's necessarily always about, I mean, we can improve our own work practices, but it's about creating um, a culture that kind of is much more about transparency and accessibility of data and sharing this. Um, part of that work at the moment is an NSF funded project on developing standards for data citation. So, Although it is up to each of us to make changes in our research practice um, and try and make our data more accessible, I don't think it's necessary that each individual should have to come up with a data citation standard of their own. Um, and nor do the people, um, so Andrea Berez Croker, who's one of my co-authors, is one of the PIs on this grant, principal investigator on this grant. Um, and they are planning to do some of the difficult work for the rest of us and come up with some kind of style sheet um, for kind of best practice in attribution. They're working with Delaman, the archives network, to ensure it's kind of going to work with archiving. So it's about minimum, even though it's about improving our work, it's doing it in a way that's as minimally obtrusive and based on the kind of standards that we're already using. Um, we can encourage our students. Um, so Andy Pauly has a really sweet article in the Nakayama and Rice LDNC special about encouraging graduate students. And it's really, it's the best way because you're getting in on the ground then and you're setting up hopefully good habits for the rest of a researcher's life. Uh, well, you know, their whole life, definitely their whole life or just their, their research life at least. Um, and we can formalise our expectations as well. And I think formalising them in some way helps establish that these are important expectations. So as one example at the University of Hawaii, in order to be awarded your PhD now, you cannot be awarded your PhD at Hawaii until your archive, um, so you have to create archiving plans as part of your dissertation proposal and then you're, you have to submit proof that your materials have been deposited with um, an archive before you're allowed to submit. So University of Hawaii will not have anyone in the future who falls into the will archive category. Um, and the descriptive theses must cite resolvable examples or resources. What was that, sorry? So they must have some kind of, uh, kind of citation that links it back to the underlying data. So that if I was particularly interested in an example, if I thought it had a kind of really interesting form, I could go back and listen. We can also encourage our colleagues. Um, the peer review process is one point at which I think it's okay to ask probing questions about the methodology that they've used and why they've used that methodology. Um, and also building these expectations into the funding and planning level for projects. So actually mention your data management process in your proposal. Actually funding 
access to archives. Archives for a long time have been working on kind of their own funding, but I think building funding in to ensure you have the time and the expertise to archive um, is another way that we can do that. In order to leave you on a slightly more positive note today, uh, this is a quote from the Melbourne Linguistics in the pub. Uh, they were having a conversation about grammar writing, kind of the state of the art. And I really like this because this conversation was happening almost exactly the same time we were presenting some of this work at the um, language ICLDC documentation conference earlier in the year. And so while we're sitting there and we're like, look, not a lot of people are citing examples. Um, these early career researchers in Melbourne were saying, well, we think it's kind of obvious. It makes our work easier. It makes our research much more transparent and relatable and comparable. Um, so to me, it's heartening that perhaps we are actually kind of experiencing a culture change. And so what I feel when I look at the work my colleagues do is that everyone is already doing good work. And so this is about giving ourselves the opportunity to think about what we want to do with that work and putting that into uh, good practice into words. So thanks. Still wedging just like one field work photo into a data talk just because. They were the only published books that we looked at because we are documentation researchers first and foremost. Yeah, but, 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 the other, but you also looked at those other genres in terms of journals. Yeah. So is that comparable? Well, I mean, they're doing different things and they're doing different things better or not better. Um, I mean, we could... It was where we decided to draw the line because it's the genres that we have the most experience in and the most interest in. Um, but we, we, we've made our methodology fully transparent and we've made our list of publications. The publications will be in the um, published article. So we're happy for people to expand and replicate this with other genres and see what they find. And I think it's important that we have these conversations at the larger linguistic community level, um, but also within, you know, sub-disciplines of linguistics. Compute, computational linguists share kind of a lot of their stuff in places like GitHub, um, which are kind of repositories where you can download someone else's um, kind of computational grammar and you can test it out on a corpus of yours, which is a, a radically different way of considering reproducibility to, say, making a corpus of spoken language available online. Can I be the developer? Sure. Would you consider that people give you uh, an example? They have, they have given you some evidence on which they are going to give you claim. So do you need Sure, because no, that's okay. Your, what you've looked at are people who give examples, for example, mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> but that already is, is your data. So you have made your data accessible to the yeah. other one to keep analyzing. So I'm going to think about a particular paper while I'm responding, unless you have something related. I'm going to think about a particular paper while I give this example, um, but I won't mention it. And I'm sure you can think of other papers as well, where you've read something and someone might say, we have this phenomenon in this particular language. Here are some examples of it. And here are all the other forms that are in complementary distribution with that. And they may have missed some very 
there might be, in your analysis, this happens in evidentiality all the time. You might decide that a language has a four-way evidential distinction. And another researcher has said, oh, there's only a three-way distinction in this language. If it, it might be that if you had access to, say, a text in that language, you could check and see, well, it's interesting that they've said there's only a three-way distinction because I can very clearly see this form in their corpus. So I wonder what they're analysing it as. Or it may be, just to use an example from my own research, that occasionally I go back and listen to things and realise I'd analysed them really wrong. And the only way I can go back and listen to something four years after I wrote about it is that I know where it is because of those citations. So it's those other kind of specific examples that I think of where it's really beneficial to cite where the example comes from in the larger corpus. Um, but I think it's also a really good habit for, for your own ability to verify, let alone worrying about whether other people are ever going to see your data. Can I continue being the So medicine is... So how, and how badly do <laughs> linguistics come doing, uh, obviously not very well, yeah. uh, as opposed maybe to other empirical sciences where the same is probably happening as well, or, or not? Yeah, so the NSF grant, just anecdotally, is one of four, and the other three were given to hard sciences. Linguistics was the only kind of humanities or social science um, project that put, was um, funded to have... So the NSF project I talked about briefly is a two-year project um, in which they're trying to create some kind of standard. So other sciences are working on this too, um, but uh, to varying degrees. And there are varying uh, kind of industry-specific problems. So, for example, we know with medicine there are massive problems in terms of pharmaceutical companies not being that big on sharing negative results from trials, um, which is a problem we don't... I mean, maybe we have. We have a bit of confirmation bias. If there's something... One thing I notice when people talk about, for example, the elicitation methods that they use or the stimuli that they use is that no one ever mentions the ones that don't, ones that don't work. <laughs> no one ever says, you know what... I used the put videos and people didn't know what was happening and all I got was just a bunch of confused speakers so I didn't use them. Um, so we have a bit of like positivity bias as well, um, definitely. Yep. I, I think there's also a qualitative dimension here which relates to what Candide's talking about. I, I know of one particular example where um, a, a part of a discourse was cited researchers went back to the actual tape recordings and listened to the tape recordings, there was no continuous stretch in which that material was adjacent to, to each other. There were interventions, there were switches to another language, um, and, and what the person had done was to extract the stuff they didn't want to have there and presented what they had. So they should have put dot, dot, dot at least to show there was a gap. They should have. I think sometimes we do this qualitative, this qualitatively, for good didactic or presentational reasons. If you find a really nice example, but there's stuff in it that's too complicated for the point at which you're developing the description, or it's hesitation phenomena, or it's things that you know you may not want to include, um, then people will actually edit. What you're calling data, which I think is actually a contestable term, but well, so yeah, there's the lots of discussions. Between what actually appears in some form in a paper or a grammar or a document or whatever, yeah. and what's actually on the recording may not be a direct one at all, but not for bad purposes, but actually done for, you know, for 
exactly yeah. the kinds of reasons. So there's a lot of discussion at the moment about what counts as source data or primary data or raw data in linguistics and what those terms may actually mean across different subfields. Um, but I think your point is also important in that. So for example, we had one grammar um, and I, I can't kind of remember which one. I could probably find it. One grammar in which the, the person was like, I only worked with one speaker because I only had access to this one guy. So we just worked together on this grammar. And it's one of those things where we kind of, we're all told that it's really bad to only work with one person, but it's actually really commendable that they've been honest and transparent about that. And I think sometimes people would prefer to omit this kind of information. Um, we have to get better at accepting that, you know, if we just put in a footnote, Actually, this example had, you know, three embedded noun phrases that I've simplified so that I can fit this on the same half page or something. I think that, you know, that, that kind of plays it what I was going to ask next is that a lot of the citation methods that you show don't actually say anything about how big the corpus is or ability to use of the way people actually speak. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we didn't, um, you know, different subfields have their own traditions and the way they kind of, so it might be that your individual examples don't resolve very clearly, but you presented a lot of rich information at the start. Um, or it might be that you have these very sciencey, authoritative looking codes on every single sentence, but if I don't know what archive they're in and I can never find that archive, then Yeah, and you know, it's, it's so, I wrote my, I guess, what, what do you call the um, M field conversion? Yes, I'm getting the hang of the terminology. Upgrade, oh, upgrade, that sounds even better. Um, I wrote my upgrade paper without examples, um, cited particularly clearly. And it was strongly recommended to me um, by Nick Teberger, which will be of no surprise if any of you know him. Um, it was strongly recommended that maybe I think about ensuring that I had a good citation methodology going forward before it grew more than 100 examples. And I, like, I'm quite happy to say I couldn't find some of those examples again. And I didn't have a very, I only had about three months worth of field work to work with then. I couldn't imagine coming back to, you know, 20 years worth of shoeboxes that I'd ignored for a decade. It's, it's, kind of, it's, it's also the other thing is that, that struck me, is, again, because we did this in our genre work, you, you're talking about this big project trying to kind of make cross-disciplinary recommendations, but even within our field, you know, there's a big difference between documentary linguistics and sociolinguistics with regard to the amount of information that we give about our, our, the, our participants' performance. Um, in documentary linguistics, it's Perspective that you, you basically the person is, is identifiable because that's why a lot of people actually go to the archives is because they want the person to drag you or whatever. But in sociolinguistics, it's it's really really seems to be important that you can't identify the person who has given that data. I think that that might be an oversimplification of the discussions in language documentation. There's definitely a lot of angst about how we identify people and whether we identify them and to whom we identify them, which is why we get all these very elaborate access requirements for ELAR and, and part of why people are reluctant to open archives is this negotiation between you know, sharing, sharing recordings. Um, I don't think it's necessarily just about hoarding, hoarding all the ergatives for yourself. Um, but yeah, there are, there are kind of there are cultural attitudes within linguistics, but that also intersects with kind of attempting to be ethical researchers as well. Um, and while working within very, very different genres. Even, even people who say, oh, it doesn't matter, you, you, you can make this stuff to everyone, let me listen to it again, you think maybe we should. <laughs> well, I have a, an entire paper pondering the fact that I, I do have plenty of people who say, oh yeah, you can share this with everyone. Um, but if you don't have the internet, 
So then do you really comprehend what it means to share it with everyone? Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> these are thorny questions, indeed. <laughs> it's just that you put in a huge amount of work to create a corpus, which is always a work in progress. As you said, when you look back at some of the things you've done, it's kind of out. Um, so, how does all of this relate this? How can you, I, I mean, this question of acknowledging that your corpus is a work in progress, there's a lot of work you put in that you may want. Yeah. Well, since I'm now the boss of all linguistics and universities, um, yeah, like, so let's just start by junking the overly heavy focus on journal publications as the only acknowledgement of research output. Um, tie good corpus creation to things. So one of the discussions that we had at the Delaman workshop, mostly because it was NSF people from America, was about formally recognising corpus creation as part of a tenure application. So tying good corpus creation and management to things like tenure, to future grant accessibility, to um, job promotion, to research output. There's a lot of stuff about alt metrics now, but I don't think corpus creation necessarily falls into alt metrics. What we need is a standardised way of citing so I think because we're not in the habit of citing other people's corpora, we're not in the habit of recognising. You know, when people were citing published papers, it was very, very easy for them to follow APA because that's what they've been using their whole life, as researchers, their entire life, as children as well. Um, I'm getting to the point where I'm tired and overgeneralising ridiculously. Um, people have been using something like a standard citation for books and journals so they can implement that very easily. We have to get into the habit of thinking of corpora as citable objects within our written work as well. And that can start with things like citing your own corpus in your... So whenever I write about Yolmo, there'll be a footnote somewhere and it says all of these examples come from this corpus. This corpus is gone 2000 and whatever. It's accessible here. If you go to the citation at the end of the paper, it will tell you the day I retrieved it on. So if in five years' time I have some newer and fancier opinion about Yolmo Tone and someone says, well, in 2008 you said based on your own data that it was this, they'll be like, well, that's because that was corpus data from 2008. Getting used to having these kind of conversations makes it a lot easier. And accepting that we're flawed, this is why, part of why I run linguistics in the pub is to accept that as researchers we are human um, and that research is a <laughs> no, no scandal um, and that it's a, a practice that we need to kind of constantly be working on. The LSA actually passed a motion to recognise this a number of years ago and one really nice thing is that the Delamon have just announced a prize. Oh yeah, I should plug the Delamon prize. So Delamon have a competition aimed specifically at early career researchers. If you have... Um, Did you say what Delamon is? Delamon is the Digital Endangered Languages and Musics Archive Network. So it incorporates archives like ELA here, Paradisec, which is one of the bigger ones in Australia, Kalaiapua Hone, which is the um, University of Hawaii, um, and they all aim to meet certain expectations in terms of data management, data persistence and availability going forward. Um, archivists say really weird things like forever, um, but I just like kind of going forward for its kind of impermanence. Um, so, yeah, I think those kind of... And th something like Delamon is designed 
to take the anxiety out of archiving for you. If your archive is part of the Delman network, it should be robust enough to do the job of archiving your linguistic data. This is actually not so difficult. I mean, you know, um, <laughs> no, if you look at other fields, like epigraphers have been getting, you know, have a, have a history of publishing their transcriptions, their epigraphic transcriptions, without necessarily the analysis. Or taxonomists, you know, the people who do, who do research in biology, there's a whole there's a whole set of taxonomic collections and classification and categorization that lies behind that. I think we also have a lot of anxieties about the scope of our work that are often unfounded in light of other disciplines. So the synchrotron in Melbourne, which is like a small hadron collider, generates over eight terabytes of data every few hours, which is more than is currently in ELA um, for like a decade of work. Um, so when we think about kind of the, the scope of our data, obviously there's a human scale to it that's important to recognise um, and is important. But uh, a lot of the kind of logistical challenges we're dealing with are kind of, a lot of data management people think we're kind of cute. We're dealing with such cute amounts of data because um, we're all struggling to deal with it individually instead of collectively. Also, devil's advocate. Sure. I, if I was a PhD student listening to what you said about Hawaii, I would be really worried and really scared. I mean, you've got four years here to do your PhD. That includes first year of training and upgrade, maybe a year of field work, if you're lucky, six or eight months of field work. And then you're writing up. I see Charlotte nodding her head here. And you're supposed to also produce an archive of material which is sizable. Well, they're in the you states, know, Hawaii, so they actually have Hawaii less time a, than here. Hawaii has, you can do it. You can spend seven years doing a PhD. You can, but you can't afford Hawaii. to because you're living in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. and, and so the first I think. Years are, are, are like taught, taught programs anyway, yeah? yeah, they generally only focus on their dissertation for the last two. Uh, and the thing I would say to that is that if you start this kind of thing early, it is not actually as onerous as it sounds. It's about starting those good habits. Before you go on your first field trip, you should have, if you don't have a file naming convention before you go on your first field trip, I would be asking why you're going on your first field trip, to be honest. I think it is a lot of expectation, but we put outrageous expectations on our students and then we don't even expect that they're likely to get a job. So what's another expectation? <laughs> and one that makes their research life easier if it's properly implemented. So. That is what I would say. It's all about being lazy. Good data management is actually for the lazy. If you don't like effort, then you should do things like have consistent and retrievable file names. Okay, shall we thank Laura for our presentation?